Okay, I think we're ready to start. Excellent, great. Oh, wow, instant silence. That is great. Excellent. Okay. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. I'm Jonathan Malloy, the Associate Dean Research and Graduate in the Faculty of Public Affairs. Many of you know me. And I'm so glad to welcome so many of you back and everyone here to another edition of FPA Author Meets Reader. Thanks for coming. Yay. That's right, yeah. Before I go further, I do want, as always, in our events, to acknowledge that Carleton University, the land that Carleton University is located on, the land that we're on right here at Irene's Pub, is, of course, the, uh, the uh, traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples. And at all our events, we always try and recognize that. Uh, land acknowledgements are a very uh, common thing these days. Uh, but I do think it is important each time uh, to reflect on the land in which the university is built, the traditional inhabitants of that, of that land that, that has never been ceded, uh, and the responsibilities, uh, in my view, particularly of post-secondary institutions, uh, to further reconciliation between Canada and Indigenous peoples. We always try to acknowledge that each time at each one of our events. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this, uh, this night, where again, as, as always in FPA, we feature one of the many books uh, by our faculty. We, we produce a lot of books in the faculty, and uh, for years now, we've, we've done Author Meets Readers here at Irene's Pub. Uh, it's a chance to feature the books, to hear from the authors, and to hear from the readers uh, about the book and have a great uh, discussion. I also want to mention, if you had noticed that, of course, the book tonight is for sale at the back. Octopus Books is our partner, and they're always happy to uh, sell your copy, even just during the event. If you feel like getting up and going back and buying a copy, you, you do that. Just don't, don't feel any hesitation at all. So uh, tonight's book uh, is uh, Via Politics, uh, Borders Migration, and the Power of Locomotion. Uh, there are three authors, of course. We have one here uh, tonight. This is an international collaboration. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce uh, the one author who's with me here is uh, William Walters. Uh, William, of course, is a, uh, a professor of political science and sociology. Uh, I've always been pleased to have William as my, my colleague in the Department of Political Science. I'm also glad to see a number of his sociology and FAST colleagues here tonight as well. I get to read uh, the, the bios of, of, of each person here. Now, William, I have to say, like, if you're a regular Authormates Readers event, you may say, hey, didn't William just, didn't William do an Authormates Readers event a year or two ago? Yeah, he did for another book. And as well, I might add that tonight's book is not his newest book. He actually has an even newer one, uh, that the, the co-edited Handbook of Governmentality. Uh, he previously did State, Secu State Secrecy and Security, Reconfiguring the Covert Imaginary, uh, and William has many other books out there, many other publications and things. I might add also just uh, for five years, 2017 to 2022, he directed the Air De Deportation Project, a multi-country multi inquiry into the aerial geographies of forced removal and expulsion in and from Europe. Uh, so I'm very pleased to have had William as my colleague for many years in the Department of Political Science. His, uh, his productivity is tremendous. His citation count is enormous. Uh, and he's also, just, he's also just my coolest colleague. I've always just wanted to be cool as William. I've never, ever been able to. So it's really glad to have William with us here tonight. <laughs> I also want to introduce the two other individuals that have uh, have joined us tonight to be the readers uh, tonight. First, uh, Philippe Froud. Philippe is an associate professor in political studies at the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of uh, Ottawa. His research interests are in borders and migration, critical security studies, and African politics. Uh, he's also going to research and write on issues related to the politics of surveillance and privacy for, for diverse audiences. Uh, before he came to the University of Ottawa, he was a lecturer in, uh, at the University of York and a research fellow at the University of Sheffield. As well, I want to introduce Azara Masumi, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton University, the seventh floor, one floor up from political science there. Uh, she studies the politics of state-controlled refugee protection, uh, as well as interface between historical change, alternative historiographies, and embodied memory. Uh, she has a book coming out soon with the University of British Columbia Press on her multi-method genealogical research on Canadian refugee protection. She has a lot of other things going on. Uh, her research has been published in peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters on sex and sovereignty, limitations of feminist legal change, race and neoliberalism, and state multiculturalism. She's a community-engaged researcher with commitment to social justice and a member of the Canadian Council for Refugees. These are just the short biographies of these people. We're so glad to have them with us tonight. I'm now going to stop talking, and I'm going to turn it over to William Walters, the author, to talk about Via Politics. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for that kind uh, introduction, those kind words. Uh, thank you very much to my uh, co-presenters uh, here, and thank you to uh, 
uh, Moira for organising and uh, Karen for promotion. Um, so the day got off to a bad start, you know, when I woke up and heard that Henry Kissinger and Shane McGowan had died, and I thought, well, there goes the the chances for peace in the Middle East. But then maybe I'm overestimating the diplomatic powers of Shane McGowan. I don't know. Um, anyway, it's a, it's. I'm very grateful for you all to come out. I know that you know this time of year. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's Christmas markets. There's presents. There's wrapping and all that. So it's great that to, really great to see you here. Um, so the uh, the book Biopolitics. Um, Borders, Migration, and the Power of, of Locomotion. It's an edited book, um, and my co-editors, who can't be here tonight, um, they're both in Europe, Charles Heller, migration researcher and filmmaker uh, based in Geneva, and Lorenzo Pezzani, a architect and um, uh, artist based in, in Bologna. Uh, and originally we planned to write it as a, as a monograph, um, along with Matt Coleman, who's a professor at Ohio State, but was a, did his MA with us uh, in political economy at, at Carlton many years ago. Um, we soon realized, though, that we weren't sort of up to the task of, or our, our capabilities didn't match our ambitions. So it turned into an edited book, and Matt dropped out, but we were very grateful for his um, involvement and, and support at an early stage. And so, I mean, the book's got a great uh, cast of of collaborators, um, and, and they, they, they're really responsible for, for a lot of uh, whatever benefits it has. It took shape from multiple directions. Um, with Charles and Lorenzo, uh, they were doing really important work on boat crossings uh, in the Mediterranean. It was a project called, that they called Forensic Oceanography, um, which they started at Goldsmiths College in London, where they were using open source data such as satellite photography, uh, coupled with interviews um, with migrants and with uh, support movements and with officials um, in the Mediterranean area. And, and, and they were sort of looking to make maps and videos and reports that sought to bring transparency and accountability to situations um, where European navies and coast guards had failed to intervene uh, to help migrants in distress at sea, often, you know, those failures or those non uh, acts of non-rescue, you know, resulted in, 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 in tragedy. So in my case, the book began with a puzzle, um, which was kind of related to the work that they were doing. And it was a sort of fact that you had this, by the mid-2000s, the sort of images of, of boat crossings that you'd see everywhere, a sort of media spectacle of people crowded onto these small craft crossing the Mediterranean, trying to reach uh, Europe and the sort of mass loss of life that was happening as a result of that. And it struck me that, that one thing you could say about this was that it was a sort of um, return of the boat to the scene of migration, um, but in a morbid and perverse form. And by this, I mean that, you know, we're all familiar with those sort of scenes, those images um, of, of the 19th and early 20th century, the sort of great transatlantic migrations. You know, so if you go to Pier, 21 in Halifax or to Ellis Island in, in New York Harbor. You know, you see these images of steamers pulling out of, of, of Hamburg or Liverpool with sort of waving uh, or, or the, the scene of arrival uh, in, in, in North America. So this became one of the sort of iconic images of, of kind of settler colonial migration uh, in the 19th and, and early 20th century. And... Um, I think that in the post-war period, you know, the boat in that sense disappears from the scene of migration, you know, as more and more of the sort of transland, at least in the transatlantic world, more and more of that kind of movement starts to take, to move onto planes, right? And a plane journey, you know, is it's relatively short. I mean, in the early days, you might have stopped in Gander to refuel, and Gander has a really interesting history as a sort of place of asylum seeking for that reason. Um... But, you know, the, your, your journey might have been relatively short, probably not especially romantic or eventful. And, you know, like I think of when I came to Canada on a sort of permanent basis, you know, I was, came from London to Toronto, I'm just wearing a pair of track pants. Um, I had <laughs> I had $10 in my wallet, right? And this is sort of, it's, it's white middle class privilege, but, you know, I could say, well, 
I came to this country with just ten dollars in my in my pocket, and look at me now, sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, obviously I had a bank account and all of that, but in fact, now I just look reason. I've only got three dollars in my pocket right now, and they're, they're American dollars, so I don't know what that says, says about me. I guess I'm not very cash, or, yeah, not, not big into cash. But anyway, the, the, all, all that's to say, you know, that the, the plane contributed to this sort of abstracting away of the journey, you know, the sort of journey in the vehicle disappears from the scene of, of migration, at least again in the transatlantic world. And if you sort of read migration studies in the 1970s, 80s, there's very little there uh, probably about journeys. It's it's sort of like the, the actual movement uh, isn't so much a thing. And so what we're seeing in the Mediterranean, for example, is kind of bringing the boat back into that scene. And, and so I, I, I thought that was a very interesting um, moment. So via politics, uh, the book um, sort of says, where are the missing vehicles? You know, there's no human movement without cars, planes, uh, boats, um, bicycles, you know, just recently people biking into Finland from, the, from, from Russia. You know, or donkeys or horses or, or a pair of boots that you might need to cross uh, a mountain range. So there's no migration without these kinds of vehicles and without various kinds of prosthetics. Um, but, you know, I felt that there wasn't enough of that in border and migration writing. You know, there's a lot of attention. Things like the camp and the sanctuary uh, and the border itself are sort of made into, they're not just empirical sites, but they become concepts as well and sort of materials to sort of develop theories for better or worse you know the camp uh, for better or worse about migration but why not sort of do that with the vehicles it seems to be sort of intuitive almost that, that the vehicle should have much more and the vehicle and the route should have much more kind of presence or or, or, or irreducibility in the way we think about it so that was a big part of the, 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 the motivation uh, for the book and for the people that we kind of recruited. Um, I'll just say a couple of words about, you know, the, the ungainly and potentially confusing neologism, you know, uh, that we've got biopolitics. Well, you know, it's confusing because people sometimes hear biopolitics and they think, oh, no, not another Foucault book. You know, how boring is that? Um, you know, and the, Foucault provided some of the inspiration for our method, but it's not a, a, a work of Foucault worship or even Foucault scholarship. So via politics instead, you know, with a V, um, has at least three meanings. Um, via refers to the means of travel. Uh, I came to Ottawa via train. And second is the route that you might take. I travelled via Toronto. And third, uh, and this is something I don't think we did enough in the book, but it would be nice to do it further, it refers to the road or the way, you know, from the Latin via. Um, and here we wanted to sort of summon something that seems transcendental in different cultures. You know, it's the fact that the road, the way, the journey is this sort of hugely powerful and recurring motif, a sort of metaphor, a symbol across many uh, cultures. You know, think of the road and the journey in Christianity. Think of Icarus and Daedalus and tragedy. Well, think of what the author Joseph Campbell um, famously called the monomyth, you know, the, the hero's journey. And of course in Canada, or at least this part of Canada, VIA has a fourth meaning, and here it stands for the, the most underfunded railway service probably in North America, a train that, um, that waits for the goods to pass, you know, a, a train where the logs move faster. Uh, than the people, <laughs> in other words, a, a synonym for, for lateness. And so that if, if anyone's coming to this event via VIA, uh, maybe from via Montreal or Kingston, then uh, you're probably not here <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, that, that's a little bit about the word, uh, about the term, and, and, and we work, the authors work it in different ways. In, in my chapter, I wrote about, along with my um, collaborator Clara Le Cadet uh, in, in Paris and I wrote about air deportation, you know, and here, here the, the, the argument I think could be made even more strongly that, you know, even though there's now a large literature about deportation, it writes about social movements, it writes about detention centres, it looks at struggles, it looks at legal cases, 
But, you know, the actual physical way in which people are often forcibly moved barely features in it at all. You know, and again, if you're looking at, say, how European countries deport people globally, you know, they rely overwhelmingly on airlines, on civil aviation. And so why wouldn't, you know, planes and, and, and airline companies and airports be given a much more central place in our thinking about these things? And, and so, yeah, that was, the, we, we were sort of interested in, in, in how the vehicle, the plane especially, features both as a sort of material site where struggles go on and planes make a difference. You know, just consider the fact that the, the pilot is a kind of sovereign especially once the plane is in flight. Even when the plane is sitting on the runway, once the doors are closed, the pilot has a kind of sovereignty, you know, and you can trace that sovereignty back to the seas where, you know, you have um, even a sort of avowed communist like Friedrich Engels says, you know, there will be communism and sort of collective rule everywhere except on the high seas where it's really you need somebody who's in charge. You know, you can't have, when you're the ship in trouble, you can't sort of get a committee together and sort of vote about what you're going to do. No, you need this sort of sovereign figure who says, this will be done, you know. And, and, and of course, that then via the sea boat that turns into the kind of sovereignty of the of the pilot. So pilots, you know, they have the power to say if somebody's struggling on a plane, this is not safe, you know, in the name of aviation safety, you can't fly this person. They don't do that all that much, but they do it sometimes. So it shows you that the plane and is a little bottleneck. It's a sort of potential choke point in the process. So the plane is sort of a, a, both a material zone in, in the process, but it's also a very symbolic process because, you know, one of the things that, that uh, a lot of our governments do, but precisely because these flights get disrupted, um, they sort of create charter flights, you know, and, and on a charter plane, nobody can hear you scream. Right? And that's that's a quote from uh, an interview with a sort of senior borders official. No one's there to hear you scream when you're on the charter plane. And the charter plane will leave, you know, in the middle of the night from a remote part of the airport, maybe leave from a military airport. And that's matters because you know um the I mean, it's very secretive and, and shady but you know it, what does it sound like what does that kind of image of people disappearing in the middle of the night on a plane bring to mind it brings to mind things like you know other situations in which people have disappeared on planes whether it was in the dirty wars in chile and argentina uh, or more recently sort of extraordinary renditions now i mean i'm not saying that the air deportation on charter is the same as those things but there's echoes, and there are echoes that, you know, um, activists and migrants themselves will draw upon to sort of denounce this practice, sort of say, well, this is a sort of sinister kind of... So, in other words, the plane is there as a, also as a sort of symbolic field, as a, as a, as a way to sort of mobilise um, uh, concern. Uh, and, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's about everything I, I wanted to say. So, uh, other than answering any questions and comments that you'll have, but thank you again for coming along. This, so we'd like to have some reaction from, we didn't ask, discuss who's going next, but who would like to speak further? Um, yeah, sure, I'm happy to, happy to jump in. Um, so a lot of my reaction to this book is, filtered through experience of researching migration and, and border security in, in West Africa in particular. And in fact, coming into that interest from a sort of long-standing um, interest in, you know, why some people can move and why some people can't. And in fact, um, I don't mean to make this too autobiographical, but one of the first, as a, as a young person, one of the first things that made me realize, in fact, we had a very globally stratified system of mobility, was reading about two young boys from Guinea who had tried to climb into the landing gear of a flight to Brussels from Conakry in Guinea, and who in fact had fallen out on arrival. But they had written a note, and they had written a note to the leaders of Europe about the aspirations of African youth. That for me was very formative in terms of realizing the extents to which people would go to travel to the global north. Um, fast forward a number of years, um, I was interested in surveillance and security studies, 
And when I was trying to figure out where I would do my PhD, actually, I had a meeting with William, and one of the first things he mentioned was about being interested in uh, ships and the narratives of arrival around ships, which you see very clearly uh, uh, in the book. And that all pieced together in my brain as the years went by, um, which, and, and seeing this book is the sort of culmination of, of that thought process has been very interesting because even though I didn't work with you for my PhD, um, no offense or no, <laughs> no nothing personal, uh, but in the end I ended up chasing the missing vehicles, in fact, that are so core to that curiosity that, that animates the question of via politics. Um, so in my own work, I became very interested in how vehicles kind of symbolized uh, how the European Union and European member states in general tried to move their borders into new spaces, and especially in Africa, to try and preempt human mobility at source. And ended up kind of doing some of this work without knowing, uh, until I could find a sort of word for it, the sort of chasing the missing vehicles that represented certain elements that were of interest to me. And one of those was, how do external actors frame the ways that they work with local actors, especially in the police sector. And one of the ways is this kind of relationship of development, right? So you often find that investments are made in countries like Senegal, in Guinea, in Mali, and elsewhere, uh, which are intended to reinforce the capacity of these countries to prevent people from trying to go to Europe. And one of the key elements of that is donations, donations of equipment, donations and training uh, in terms of reinforcing security sector capacity, training the police, and so on. And consistently in those conversations, vehicles come up. And they come up and are very reflective of how, uh, how all of those people envision their place in that system. Right, so European police and diplomats who work in West Africa, who are working on questions of migration, are often sort of taken aback by the requests that are made by local police institutions for more vehicles. Right, they say they keep asking us for cars, they keep asking us for trucks because they want to show off in these vehicles. Right, that betrays a certain uh, sensibility and 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 way that that African states and officials from African states are perceived by their European partners when we think about migration management. So that already was, was one thing that resonated me a lot in terms of thinking about uh, the role of vehicles in migration management. So I think the concept via politics is useful for that very sort of blunt material question, right, of like where are the vehicles, what do they symbolize, what do they tell us about the ways that North and South relate, uh, and Africa's place in the world, and how, in fact, migration is managed today. But beyond that, I think there's something also that goes beyond the vehicle, and I think that's one of the big contributions of this concept and of the book that's built around it, which is that this is not just looking at some kind of technical thing. It's not just looking at vehicles as some kind of technical um, tool that we are just going to focus on for its own sake, right? It's trying to see those as entry points into broader political questions. And one of those is the question of roots, right? And so uh, if you look at your typical article in The Economist about African migration, you're usually confronted with a map that has about a thousand arrows on it going north towards Europe. Here's how the roots are shifting. Here's how people are going through Libya. Here's where people are going now versus five years ago. So again, this question of roots and how people navigate those, whether it's sea routes, whether it's through the Sahara Desert, is foundational, in fact, to the imagination that the average sort of person in the European public has about how African people move and how people come to Europe. So for me, uh, in terms of my own work, I've come across so many of these concepts and often didn't have a name for them. So I think the key kind of contribution here is giving a name to some of those disparate questions in terms of vehicles, routes, uh, and also kind of the, the, the geography, in fact, of, of how people move. Um, I don't want to make this just research anecdotes, but um, one of the things that I noticed in working in Niger, which shares a border with Libya, and which until recently was one of the main kind of transit countries from West Africa to Europe, is that the, the Toyota Hilux pickup truck plays a sort of foundational role in irregular migration, but also in the general economy of transport across the Sahara Desert in that country. Um, and that was um, 
for me, it surprised me the extent to which it was not just seen across these kind of materials, again, in the sort of Economist article about irregular migration, you'll have pictures of pickup trucks filled with migrants crossing the desert, but even in the culture, in terms of speaking to smugglers, speaking to their families, this kind of role of the vehicle as an as a device that enables some kind of autonomy, that enables some kind of participation in the economy. I think it's it, it highlighted for me how important the vehicle is as an entry point into not just understanding policing and understanding irregular migration, but also the whole social system around it uh, and what that means. Um, one of the things that struck me in this book was a set of maps in the chapter by Casas Cortes and Copa Rubias, chapter six, I believe, which shows, in fact, how the European Union sees the states around it, right? So this, this kind of the, the Schengen zone, the, the main European states of free movement, you have the European neighborhood countries, such as, uh, you know, countries in Eastern Europe, but also along the Mediterranean, Algeria and Turkey. And then you have the transit zone. Uh, and that's where you have all the countries that I've worked in, Niger, Mauritania, uh, Mali, for example. And then you have the source countries, which are even further afield. So you have the sort of layers of an onion in terms of, not just vehicles and how people move about, but also the, the geography itself of migration. I found that to be uh, very, very instructive. Um, so perhaps just to kind of wrap up, again, it's, it's another anecdote, but it's, a, it's an instructive one that came to mind looking through so many of these different chapters, including the very good chapter on the question of passenger comfort, right? And how this question of human cargo is, delimit is kind of delimited away from other cargo. I think the point of via rail is quite interesting, right? The, the physical cargo takes priority over the human cargo in many ways. Um, I was recently flying from Paris to Nouakchott in Mauritania, and that flight continued on to Conakry in Guinea. And on that flight, there were French police who came to every single passenger and said, we are doing a deportation today on this plane. Uh, you do not say anything, do not speak, do not intervene, do not film. And Air France made it very clear that if you do any of those things, in fact, you're banned from the airline, right? So you can speak up and have solidarity, but then you lose your sort of comfort and privilege that you would have and all your frequent flyer points and all the other fancy stuff that goes with it, right? So it was very, very stark in terms of the question of comfort and the question of the border being enforced. One thing that sticks with me from that particular experience was the policeman told me, uh, sometimes there's a lot of shouting, right? It wasn't just oh, sometimes these people do. It was just like, sometimes there's some screaming, just ignore it. Uh, and I think that there's something about examining vehicles as a, uh, as a question and as an entry point into understanding migration that is, it shows us north-south relationships between states. It shows us how security functions. It, it helps us to understand how some people move and how some people don't. And it also, I think, if this sort of Air France story of mine is is a reminder, it also shows us, in fact, the highly classed uh, and class-driven distinctions on which so much of this uh, question of borders and global global segregation actually functions. So I'll keep my comments to that, but thank you very much for the opportunity to really engage with the book. All right. Um, so thank you so much for having me with you tonight. Uh, I must say that this is a great pleasure and honor to be here. I uh, began reading William's work in my graduate studies as I was beginning to become interested in thinking through questions of forced migration, access to mobility and safety and so on, and it really did make a huge impact for me. So it's really humbling and a little surreal for me to be here today um, commenting on this fantastic collection. So thanks for inviting me. Uh, Via Politics is an exceptional and insightful collection that invites us, and by that I mean people in the field of migration studies, to consider mobility from the more material, intimate, and at once foundational vantage point of the means, vehicles, and vessels that make movement possible. I think this reorientation of our perspective in relation to migration allows us to have a much more phenomenological understanding of the actual and material bodies that migrate and the processes that regulate the bodies on the move. Most importantly, I think this approach allows us to ask different and at times uh, more generative qu uh, questions. 
I can go on and on about the contribution of this collection to the field of migration studies to which I myself belong, but I would much prefer to showcase the potency and insightfulness of geopolitics by applying it to an example of forced mi mass mo forced migration that is happening in front of our eyes at this moment in Gaza. And you have to excuse me, I'm a scholar of forced migration and it is my occupational habit to look for um, events of mass migration and the patterns of access to mobility. And there's much that can be said, of, obviously, about the devastating effects of the siege and bombardment on the Gaza Strip. But in my brief notes today, I will focus on aspects of this tragedy that I believe can be very insightfully analyzed from the lens of geopolitics with the hopes of demonstrating the exceptional range of questions that this approach would allow us. Via politics, as William um, noted, gets its name from the three meanings of the word via. In the first meaning, via refers to the vehicles that make migration possible. In the case of Gaza, thinking about vehicles of migration encourages us to consider how do large numbers of people who have been ordered immediate evacuation may in fact move quickly under literal threat of bombs. What are the vehicles that they use so to move? And especially, how may they use these vehicles given the chronic and more recent acute shortage of fuel in, in Gaza? It is in this context that we have seen footage of uh, overcrowded vehicles filled to the brim with the elderly and those with mobility limitations, as well as the use of use of hand-pulled carts to move belongings, and above all, hundreds and hundreds of people on foot carrying luggage and mattresses hanging from their arms. The focus on vehicles of migration allows us to consider the human body as sometimes the only remaining vehicle, and the toll that this must take on the feet, on the back, and then the overworked and emaciated muscles. The second meaning of VIA references the roots and structure infrastructure of travel. This meaning asks us to consider which points people may choose to, to or be forced to move through in their journeys from one point to another. In the instance of the mass displacement in Gaza, we all have heard a lot about the Rafah border crossing with Egypt as the supposedly only exit point out of Gaza. But it might be helpful for us to be reminded that, in fact, the largest land border, uh, 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 Gaza's largest land border is not with Egypt, but with Israel itself. And yet, the possibility of civilians escaping through the neighboring Israel is completely muted. In the twisted geopolitical reality that surrounds Gaza, Egypt remains the only land neighbor, the only exit route, producing an exceptionally packed bottleneck at this very one and single uh, border crossing. And of course, it's the evacuation order itself that created, creates this bottleneck by ordering evacuees to the south of the Strip and not, for example, towards the north, towards Lebanon. And thus, it is at this one point, uh, border point, which is heavily guarded, that Gazans huddle and wait and wait again to be allowed exit. Via politics helps us to be reminded of the fact that the possibility of exiting Gaza only through Rafa is purely politically driven. The third meaning of via refers to the geophysical environment that migrants traverse and states aim to control. Thinking about the geographical landscape of Gaza's displacement from a geopolitical perspective, one may also wonder about the large coast to the west and the open air above, and yet the fact that land travel remains the only viable option. We might take it for granted that Gazans must exit through a land border with Egypt, but this reality is only produced by the impossibility of air evacuation due to bombings and sea travel due to the militarization of the Mediterranean Sea. 
In other words, the Jew the geophysical environment that displaced Gazans must navigate is deeply shaped by political forces. I said all this to um, kind of argue that geopolitics allows us to consider the displacement of Gazans with fresh eyes and ask different questions about the possibilities and moves of uh, means means of movement. And I will conclude my half-baked remarks here and look forward to your comments on the book. Thank you. I didn't find them half-baked at all. William, I saw you taking a lot of notes there. I thought you might want to respond to some of the things that the others have said. Uh, where I'll be? Am I on again? Yeah, I'll be very, I'll be, I'll be very brief because uh, I'm really keen to hear what people might have, have to say. But I'm, you know, I'm very grateful for these comments and. Um, I think in with what you both said, um, what I like is that that biopolitics has been sort of like a sensitizing device, so that maybe you know that, that there were things there that you knew about them already. You could see them, you read about them, you experience them firsthand, and the book and the term sort of it gives you sort of added jolt or something or i mean i think of it a, a bit like a a license or maybe that's not the right word but i mean there's lots of times when i've worked on things and i think nobody's written about this um probably because there's nothing much to say or like i'm not i better not say i better not write about it because you know i'll look stupid because I, there must be a reason why nobody's written about this yet you know and so when you finally see somebody that does you sort of think oh yeah maybe that's because yeah, maybe there is something to be, to be said so you know if it works like that i'm really happy i mean to, to pick up on what um Philippe was saying about Toyotas, you know, it suddenly made me think, isn't it interesting? You know, when I started in graduate school, all the talk was of Fordism and post-Fordism, right? These were this is a cars, it's like a car brand, you know, it's like a, an entire theory of capitalism and the world and everything built out of this car brand, right? And, you know, I think people did start to play around a little bit with other brands of cars. Um, Bentleyism, I don't know, <laughs> Leitrim, but you know, there's a sort of Toyota, Toyotaism uh, that, that you're talking about there, and I think, yeah, there's the a sort of symbolism of a, of a pickup truck. Um, and I mean, another thing I would say is that one reason that we did this was um, we kind of wanted to get away from just from we we wanted it. It was a sort of we were a little bit concerned by a sort of border fetishism you know like obsessively you know trying to develop some grand theory of the border that you can then process everything about migration through that because after all it doesn't a it doesn't capture all the situations where people aren't necessarily crossing the borders because they're internally displaced or they're sort of moving around china for example some of the biggest movements in human history are inside china um so it was to sort of get away a little bit from from a sort of border fetishism and, and also yeah to, to bring some dynamism in because after all again the border even though we might say oh the border stretched and it's, it's moved and all of those things which is true that still you're still talking about a a line or a structure or a division uh, but there's something very dynamic about vehicles and travel and it's true that some of this work is now done under the a lot of it's done under the heading of mobility and we had a kind of discussion about mobility when we were writing the book and the reviewers, some of whom were mobility scholars, were saying, yes, what about mobility? You know, you need to pay us our due. And we said, yes, you're quite right. So we put more of that in. But then one of the reasons we didn't want to do it under the heading of mobility, and this is something we did learn from Foucault, is that, you know, mobility is like this, this buzzword. It's like a, it's a good thing for the most part in our societies. You know, it's like apple pie. Who, you know, everyone sort of, says good things about mobility. Governments talk about mobility. They want to promote it. And, and so you get into, I think, a bit of a, there's a kind of anachronism. If you start talking about the things happening in the 18th century in the language of mobility, where, you know, it was a term that the 18th century wouldn't have used itself. So it seemed better to us to have a sort of synthetic 
term that couldn't be accused of, of, of anachronism. Um, and I like the reference to the vessel as well, because it sort of takes us back to, you know, vessels aren't necessarily vehicles. Vessels might be silos that you store grain or water in, which is a very interesting point. Makes me think of, I can never remember his name. He wrote Technics and Civilization. Mumford, Lewis Mumford, right? He, he has some wonderful things to say about vessels and cities and civilization. Yeah, thank you again. All right. Well, now we move to the we move to the part of the evening of uh, questions. We have a microphone up there. I'm also, I also encourage the panelists to sort of inter, interplay and engage further. More things, more things pop in your head. But I do encourage the audience to come to the microphone to post question, comment, reflection, air, airline story, anything there. Oh, pardon, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this was a really interesting uh, introduction to the book. I am not yet a reader of the book, but um, I just had a couple of questions about William's introduction about sort of possible genealogies of via politics. And what I was struck by, and I mean, this may uh, just have been a selection of what you decided to mention in your introduction and not what's reflected in the book. So I am wondering if... Um, there are other genealogies of the boat in particular and of the sea that are um, reflected in the book. So, I mean, I, I was just struck by the fact that you sort of um, evoked a kind of white Atlantic um, as the genealogy of how we think about, how we may think about via politics or that for the disappearance of via politics in scholarship. But of course, there's also the black Atlantic and the slave ship. Um, as a kind of genealogy, and then more recently, I mean, we could also think of the ships that uh, uh, transported Jews who were fleeing from the Nazis um, uh, during World War II. <clears throat> um, and it seems to me that, uh, I mean, these uh, kinds of vessels would be quite connected to the what I take to be sort of critical approaches to via politics in various chapters of the book. I mean, and sort of also in terms of the regional contacts that Philip talked about. And so that's my first question, to what extent, um, well, what one could broadly call the Black Atlantic is sort of reflected as a genealogy of, and perhaps the original via politics of modernity, in fact, I would venture to say, I mean, I haven't thought about this, but. Um, <clears throat> and secondly, um, sort of in, in also in relation to your comment about um, Engels and that he thought that the sea was a space where you needed the sovereign. Um, I was sort of thinking more of Carl Schmidt, and who sort of said that the sea is a space without sovereignty. That's the space of the pirate and the, well, in the examples which I gave earlier, the slave trader or today the migration broker or something like that. So um, I was just wondering about, uh, well, sort of the, the, the role of I mean, how, how, how sovereignty and its others are being discussed in relation to via politics in the book. Yeah, okay, thank you, Hans Martin. I mean, I mean uh, the answer to the first question would be um, that, say, questions of slavery and the Black Atlantic feed in, for example, to the chapter by Renisa Mawani about the the, 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 the journey of the Komagata Maru that, that comes from India to British Columbia. And she uses explicitly the, the term or the concept of the middle uh, passage uh, to partly capture like both ways in which um, travelers on that ship might have talked about their own experience, but also to sort of draw from uh, the literature that you're talking about precisely the sort of idea that a certain kind of solidarity can arise in the journey under the most desperate circumstances. Now, the Komagata Maru was not a slave ship, but it, you know, it was a, a, a long journey uh, under very difficult circumstances where she says, you know, there was sort of new kinds of affiliations that, that, that took shape amongst the, 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 the passengers who were of quite very diverse uh, backgrounds. There were Sikhs and Muslims and, and Hindus. And, um, 
And so for her, yes, the Black Atlantic then is important for helping us think about how the ship isn't just uh, a vehicle or a vessel, but, you know, a, a, an experience, right? It's a sort of, uh, it's not just a sort of movement from A to B. It's a, it's a time space in which transformation happens in, in good and, and often in very bad ways. Um, the second point about Schmidt, I think this came up when I, the very first time I started to talk about this. And I think what I'd say is that, you know, Schmidt is talking about a different time. So certainly if you're looking, if you're talking about, and Philippe would know much more about this than me, but if you're looking at the, say, the Mediterranean now, it's not a case of, of, of space that's sort of somehow beyond sovereignty. It's so striated, you know, and this is what Charles and Lorenzo work on, especially, you know, got all these different zones, like a search and rescue zone, um, and these are all kind of, um, distributed amongst the states, you know, so, and they don't necessarily overlap, there's sort of, and, 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 and what happens on the fate of a ship very much depends on which of these zones it's in, and the states are playing games, but we want you to get out of our zone, we want to stop you before you get into our zone, so I would say that the, the sea is extremely sort of striated, and, and, and there's a there's a very significant sort of sovereign politics going on there. But there would be other places where perhaps we could talk about this um, this space that's sort of at a threshold, you know, and maybe if we're talking about the moon and, 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 and you know, interplanetary travel, then we're getting into sort of, you know, there's a bit of a scramble going on around the moon about, you know, who gets to put um, various kinds of devices on what parts of the moon. There's a sort of countries are, 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 are like scrambling for the moon in some ways. And what do you do about space junk? We've got a first year student writing a brilliant paper about space junk, you know. How can you regulate this stuff? And you know, the more that SpaceX sends up there, the more there's going to be of this stuff, because you've seen their approach to space travel. It's like disposable, it's super disposable, right? Uh, just a, actually a quick point on the question of uh, the sea, and I think the, this point about the sea being highly surveilled and highly uh, watched and known in many ways as a space is very clear in the in the Mediterranean. Uh, there have been huge investments by the EU in like satellite surveillance and sensors and detection and all these types of things. So in fact, uh, you know, when when boats do sink or you know capsize boats full of migrants in the Mediterranean, that's very often the product of a kind of deliberate looking away rather than a kind of misunderstanding or misapprehension of of what's actually happening on the sea. I use that as an entry point into uh, a line that stuck with me from one interview with an official I did in in Brussels, who mentioned to me in fact that we have to sort of see the desert, referring to the Sahara, as very similar to the sea. In fact, we shouldn't see these as very very distinct spaces. Um, because they have very similar, you know, you have similar routes that you have to take. There are routes that are historically very powerful and uh, that smugglers and others have used over time. Um, and in fact, this idea that the desert and the sea are similar, even though they require different vehicles, obviously, but it's, it's actually one that I've encountered now in a bunch of different conversations. The International Organization for Migration as well consistently points out, you know, the Mediterranean is deadly, but we also need to see the Sahara Desert as being equally deadly. It's like another Mediterranean, but we don't hear as much about it because it's further away. And so this idea of equivalence across different routes, but also the grounding of those routes is very, very uh uh, powerful. One last reflection in terms of the kind of colonial anchoring of a lot of these things, like when we look at the Sahara, again, I keep coming back to the zone that I know best, but the a lot of the routes that smugglers take are very, very long established, that are long, deeply in, uh, entrenched cross or trans-Saharan trade routes, for example. Um, but I found it very interesting to, in the case of the Komagata Maru, for example, the it was sort of the re initial rejection was because of the indirect journey, right? It's like this idea that the British colonial authorities said, if you stop on the way, well, you should have you should have got out there instead. And that reminds me a lot of the safe third country agreement. It seems to be a very similar idea that we have with the United States, which is, well, the US is safe. If you stop there first, you can't come to Canada, right? And so it's a, we have different ways of describing these things. We have different legal frameworks. We talk about human rights a bit more, but some of these ways of thinking about roots and, 
where people came via somewhere else. In fact, we are very similar across uh, the centuries. Yeah, I think at the question of uh, the Black Atlantic, I think you're, you know, you're right on point. And I think the book references that a little bit, but also, you know, when you think about the height of engineering that went into creation of the slave ships, I think biopolitics really makes you think about the vehicle as part of the production of the slave and of the enslaved, as part of the commodification of human body, the sort of like the technology that went into creating, like optimizing the number of people and their containment and detainment and sort of their physical restraint. And I, I think we can sort of like not separate that from the journey itself. And I think it's, um, I mean, it's like, I think where, I think migration studies can meet um, the, you know, scholarship on transatlantic slave trade, but it, that's precisely a very good point of like meeting the two scholarships to be like, how did this, you know, the vehicle was a huge product, like a part of the production of the enslaved and a means of movement, a, a means of like forcibly removing people. So I think it's a, speaks to that perfectly. More questions at all from the audience. If your question is, where can I buy this book? You know the answer. It's at the back. How much is it? It's, it's a great bargain. Two <laughs> big chips. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts? This engagement. Laura, please. Thanks. Thanks very much to all of you for your comments. Um, so William, you said um, something about, well, we can't think about mobility without thinking the about the planes and the boats and the cars and so forth that transport people. And then you threw in booths at the end. And as an Americanist, um, you know, most of the people coming north or even within the south are traveling by foot. And I and and um, Sarah, you talked about the the migrants in Gaza who are mostly going to be traveling by foot. So I'm just wondering, do you see boots as the same as cars? I, of course, by via you're also talking about routes and so forth. So I I totally get that this would be a useful framework for looking at that. But I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. And I just thought you. Um, I was uh, also thinking about environmental issues, if you also could link this to thinking about the car as the preeminent form of transportation, which is, and the link in political economy to the, the pet, pet, petroleum fuel tr transportation form as the favored form of mobility. Thanks very much. Um. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, th there's a great question about um, walking, and one of the chapters in the book is about migrants who walk across the Alps. Um, you know, that's not such a dissimilar scenario. And I think one of the things, that, and, and I think this was something that Azar was was raising with the Gaza example, that when you know, if somebody walks across a desert or, or walks a long distance like that, it's not because they can't afford a bus, you know? I mean, if people take boats across the Mediterranean, it's not because they can't afford a flight, because the flights have never been cheaper. I mean, it's changed a little bit now, but, you know, since the budget airlines come along, flying has never been cheaper, right? So it's not about money. It's about how other... Uh, modes and, and routes and ways that become blocked off to certain people, right? It's about the stratification of it. And I think that one of the, you know, we can't understand what, say, happens in the Mediterranean without kind of taking into effect aviation, right? Because I think it's precisely because of the, there's something about the ability of authorities to sort of control airports especially you know that they become the most difficult places and not by no means impossible because you know all sorts of you, you, you if, if you, you it becomes what julie chu in the book calls paper routes you know you have to engage in all sorts of activities to acquire the papers and maybe to change your face so that you can pass through the channel of aviation 
uh, and that happens. But there's something about the extent to which aviation systems can be sort of so well surveyed and controlled that forces people into these other modes. So, you know, you control, after all, our kind of narratives of modernity and progress sort of say, well, you know, the, the, the ship is this sort of old ancient thing, then along comes the train, and then, you know, by the 1950s, you think of aviation as the sort of future. So that's, so when the boat comes back, returns to the scene of migration, it's this sort of paradox, isn't it? Because we thought, thought this was a, was, a, was a thing from the past, and it comes back precisely because, or partly because of the control over aviation. And that control wasn't just about migration. Like 1970s hijacking, uh, all sorts of fears about, you know, that, that have come from somewhere else. Like, we've got to control planes, we've got to control airports, we can't have them turned into weapons, and, and, and so on. So that was a kind of conjuncture. Um, so, yeah, that's why, and that's one reason why walking, it's relational, right? The, the walking and, and, and the swimming and, and, and so on is precisely because of what's happened with those other routes and vehicles. Um, the environmental thing, yeah, I think that's, it's not something we really talked about in the book at all, really, but yeah, you can sort of look at the electric car as a sort of, you know, it's our... One of the ways we now dream about a, a future that sort of somehow squares the circle, you know. Or if, again, I've got another student in the first year class writing an excellent paper on Porsche and e fuel. You know, like Porsche is saying <laughs> we can't sell enough electric cars. If we can just fix e fuel, you can sort of have it all, kind of thing. You know, it's sort of like we, we can't quite give up the car no matter how, things, how bad things might get. Um, yeah, maybe on the question of fuel, I mean, it brings up the question of, of emissions and air, and more generally, I think th there was a particular point in one of the chapters, on the one on, on human cargo, if I remember correctly, which was about ventilation, right, sort of bad air, what do you do about that? And the thing that came to mind for me was the pandemic and the way that that also shifted, uh, you know, not just at borders and questions of how people move internationally, but also how we move around the city, right? So the use of personal vehicles went up quite a lot in part because it was a ventilation question, right? Like if you can avoid being in a bus with 52 people, you can be in your own little sort of ventilated bubble and you can have your music and all the rest. So this kind of question of mobility became tied to also questions of kind of clean air, safe air, or or not. Uh, and it seems that, you know, that's that's one observation, but I think it's also when we look at what's going on in terms of how borders are controlled, how mobility gets channeled today, a lot of it is using that sort of justification of avoiding uh, contact, right? So lots of technologies like facial recognition are being rebranded as kind of contactless identification, especially in a post-pandemic context. Airlines, airport authorities are using uh, social distancing as a justification to in uh, to launch more things like uh, facial recognition in place of a paper boarding card right at the airport. Uh, so it's um, it, it does seem to me that this question of air and clean air and maintaining cleanliness and health is also part of the justification of like how how we move and and how we access in fact these these modes of mobility. That question of the Walking, I think we sort of we have to think about the human body as the form of, as a form of vehicle. And I think people, in the case of sort of pe people on the move who are trying to find safety, I think walk sometimes so that they're not detected. And I think in the case of Gaza, they walk because what else? What else can one possibly do? Even if you have a car and you don't have fuel, like it's the last remaining way. To move, and I think um, the question of the emissions and environment is really fascinating because I don't think 
people who are on the move to find safety are not thinking about the most environmental <laughs> way of uh, movement. They're just like looking for safety. And I think it's, I think I actually quite like the way that real politics makes us think about how do people actually, what, how do they, like, how do they literally get from this point to the other? And what are the options? And, you know, the options are sort of very direly controlled and limited and regulated by these much wider forces that are around them. And some of it is about border control and some of it is about, you know, racial sanctions or, you know, like things that are, you know, seem to be unrelated to border control in that sense. One, one thing I, I would also say about, um, um, say, walking or when you have to take a small boat is it, 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 crea it creates a scene where the, the where you become debased or degraded by the fact that you are walking. You know, so it becomes a. Now of course, it's all contextual because if to, to photograph somebody hiking in the mountains, that's great. You know, it's all sort of about health and environment and outdoors. But the sort of when you're sort of walking out of place, um, you become sort of othered by the very fact of that you're walking. You know, where everyone else is 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 taking transport or the fact that you're in a boat, you know. Hence we have from the 70s, you know, the boat people. The, the boat, mm -hmm. uh, you've got to ask yourself, why does, under what conditions do, do a, does a people or a community or a group come to be named by, <laughs> by the vehicle, right? We don't speak of the plain people, you know, all the people who've come to Canada. The plain people started to arrive here in the 50s, you know, but we have the boat people. Well, we talk about the caravans of people coming yeah. from, you know, like there's a... Yeah. And there's a very class thing, obviously, there. That's... All right, thank you very much. We are coming, I think, to a close of our time. So I am going to start to draw things to a close. Uh, I want to thank very much first William for allowing allowing us to uh, feature your book uh, of you and your co-editors. Uh, so it's great to hear about the book. So thanks very much, uh, Philippe and Asad. I'm so glad that you joined us uh, to speak about the book, uh, to lend your own expertise, to apply it to current issues as you did Asad there. Uh, so uh, we really have we're so glad to have our, our guest from the University of Ottawa and from, and from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, William's other department. <laughs> Uh, so, 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 Philippe, thank you so much for coming up, for sitting on our little stools here, and uh, for, for engaging with this, and for the audience, uh, for your questions and your engagement. Uh, I do have a couple of uh, closing uh, remarks and thanks. I first want to say that, of course, we this is a series. Author Meets Readers uh, keeps going. Uh, we do not have one in December. Don't, don't come here in December. Actually, do come here. Irene's probably happy to have you here every single night. Uh, but we, but Author Meets Readers will take a break for December. We'll be back in January, on Thursday, January 25th, I believe. Uh, Duncan McHugh from the School of Journalism and Communication will be speaking on his book on in, in Indigenizing Journalism. So that's uh, in late January. And just so you're thinking about the lineup, in February, our featured author will be Susan Bradley of the School of Social Work on, on her new book. On March will be another of my political science colleagues, Melissa Hausman, uh, on her new book. In April, we actually have a vacancy at the moment for April and Author Meets Readers. We had a cancellation. Uh, we're looking for books. If, if no one fills it, I'll fill one of my own books. Um, but we'd like to have, well, so anyone anyone here who's an FBA who has a book that uh, that hasn't been featured yet, we, we do have a vacancy, so please uh, let, let us know. Uh, but for the audience, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much uh, for hearing about this book. We hope to see you at further events. I do want to, of course, thank certain people uh, for this. I first want to thank uh, our friends at Irene's Pub and Mike for, uh, for hosting us many, many times. Not sure how many, uh, maybe up to 10 years we've been doing this. It's not sure, but Irene's Pub has been a great partner for this. Also, Octopus Books. I, if I mentioned before, the book is for sale at the back. I don't know if I mentioned that. As Octopus Books has been, has been a great partner with us as well. And also, I do want to thank the people in the Faculty of Public Affairs who make this happen. So, uh, Moira McGrath, our events coordinator, who's at the back, who uh, arranges all this. Also, Jeff Poissant, who has been running the camera and the technology. So, Jeff. Thank you very much for that. And if Karen Kelly and her comms uh, team are here, they put a lot of work into the posters. If you saw the video of William uh, speaking about his book, we, uh, we put on quite a comms push for this event. So uh, thanks to them for that. But thanks ultimately for, for the author, for the readers, and for all of you that came out uh, for this event. So thanks very much, and please have a safe evening. Bye-bye.